Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Father God, speak to our hearts, I pray today, that the, the word you want us to hear, the, the message we need to hear, will be what your spirit brings to us. And I pray, Lord, that you will use me as your instrument to uh, minister to each heart in the need that they need met today. May they find it in you, Father. Father, I know that for me to do any good in that respect, it's it's impossible. But with you, all things are possible. So, God, I pray that you will transform us into the image of your Son. You will speak to our hearts and, and make us new and encourage us and strengthen us, whatever we need, Lord. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So in this sermon series, we're looking at ways that Jesus has impacted our world and and, and made such a huge difference in the world as we know it. And when you look at the group of men that Jesus surrounded himself with, his inner circle of disciples, one of the things that stands out is that they were not the theological masterminds of their time. They were not the ones who had spent their leisure hours debating the Torah and the finer parts of the law. They were by and large an uneducated bunch of fishermen and laborers. And yet, after listening and learning from Jesus for a couple of years, their lives would change. And seven of the books of the New Testament would be written and attributed to two of these fishermen, James, or rather John and Peter. James was probably Jesus' brother. So John and Peter, just two ordinary fishermen, will write a book that has become the number one bestseller of all time. And we'll see later on just how much it is ahead of the second place ones. Jesus obviously had an impact on the lives of these ordinary people. But what you might not be aware of is is the dramatic impact that Jesus had on our world. It's just as we've talked this far on the welfare and the role of children and the castaway people and women and how he's changed lives for those people. Today we're going to talk about another way he's infected the world. And he's affected us in the education that we have uh, and, and, and how we've changed Uh, Science and technology, all kinds of things have been impacted by Jesus Christ. When Jesus was confronted with a bunch of Sadducees and Pharisees who wanted to trip him up and discredit his ministry, he first put the Sadducees in their place, and he said in Matthew 22, verse 29, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. And the Pharisees were saying, yes, put those Sadducees into place. It's kind of like a Raiders fan and a Chiefs fan. They, they, were, they didn't get along. And so it was great to see Jesus put the Sadducees in their place. But then the Pharisees stepped up, and they wanted to trip him up. And they thought they would test him. And Matthew 22 goes on to say that, that they got together, and one of them tested him and said, Teachers, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And you heard what he responded. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And he went on to say, the second is like it, love your enemies, or rather love your neighbors as yourself. He said, love your enemies another place though. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, all the the law and prophets, everything you want to know about how to live in this world is summed up in those two things, he said, those two commandments. When the crowds heard this, we, are, we read in Matthew 22, verse 33, when the crowds heard Jesus' answer to them, they were astounded at his teaching. His answer was, was to quote one of the most famous passages of the Torah called the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 5. But listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. You notice the difference there, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22? Love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and strength. If you're listening carefully, you would have heard that Jesus made a slight alteration in this famous passage. He added the word mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind is how Matthew reports his answer. The Christians throughout the century have, centuries have taken Jesus at his word and tried to love God with their minds. 
And the result is that the world is a much different place than it would have been. Now, I'm not saying that the world is everything that God wants it to be, or it would, should be, that we've completed the work that he's called us to do. But I believe that each generation, including ours, must commit ourselves to loving God with our minds and with our whole being. And that includes our mind and our intellectual gifts that God has given us. So we are, are called, as, as I've said each week, to carry on the work that we've seen begun in other generations and not to let it die with us. Christians through the centuries have taken Jesus at his word and tried to love God with their minds, and the world is a much different place. John Ortberg, in his book, Who is This Man? The, Unpre the Unpredictable Impact of the Inescapable Jesus, says, The historical impact of Jesus' thinking is so pervasive that it's often taken for granted. The record of his life and teachings, the Gospels, have impacted the world so much that they have been translated into 2,527 languages. The second most translated book, Don Quixote, has been translated into 60 languages. 2,527 to 60. The score of the Chiefs game this afternoon. The Bible is the best-selling book of all time. Jesus was called teacher or rabbi at least 11 times in the Gospels. Sometimes they called him good teacher. He taught not to transfer information, but to transform lives. Last Sunday, I told you how remarkable it was that Jesus invited everyone to be his disciple, including women we talked about last week. Children were invited to come to him. The sick and deformed were embraced by him and welcomed into his fellowship. And his disciples followed that example that he set. As Acts 5.42 says, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. In the, Rome, in the world of the Romans and the Greeks, formal education was reserved for male children of wealthy families. But the leaders of the church remembered that they followed a man who taught everyone and who commanded them to go and make disciples and teaching them to obey everything he commanded. And so they began to see education as something for everyone, not just rich boys. In A.D. 150, a man named Justin Martyr founded the first schools in Ephesus and Rome. And Christians in those days believed that God created everything, and therefore we can learn how things in work in creation, and we're learning about God when we do. And so uh, studying math and logic and, and the physical world were all ways of learning about God. And the reason why we do it is because we love him. Learning is an act of worship. And some Christians have worried that, that we should not read secular philosophers, as John Ortberg points out. But other Christians say, you know, uh, God can speak through anyone, even a donkey in the story of Balaam and Balak. So uh, you may feel that this person is a donkey, but you may, God may still speak to you somehow through what you're reading. Early Christians read the pagan Greeks and the Romans uh, seeking wisdom from them, too, and believing that you can find God's truth anywhere. And consequently, when the Roman Empire fell and they were conquered by barbarians who didn't read and didn't have the same language, that's, the word barbarian comes from bar, 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 because that's what it sounded like to listen to them. You couldn't understand them. So they called them barbarians. Egypt, or not Egypt, but Europe was plunged into the, what we call the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, and in that time, libraries all but disappeared, and books that had been parchments and stuff began to, to literally deteriorate and dis disappear, and so liter illiteracy became the rule in Europe. It wasn't always that way. But the one place where illiteracy was stopped and fought was in Christian circles, there's a book about how Irish monks have saved, saved the world. And Irish monasteries, the monks copied every ancient document they found, including the Greeks and the Romans, as well as the scriptures, and they, they, they would carefully copy them and preserve them because they respected knowledge as a way of coming to God. So what we know about the ancient world is thanks to the Christians who preserved it for us. Many of the great works of the Greek and Roman period would not exist today if it hadn't been for Christians who thought that they could love the Lord with their mind. 
As the Dark Ages end, ended, monasteries became the great centers of learning in, in Europe, and arithmetic and music and geometry, astronomy, Latin, Greek, grammar, rhetoric, and logic were all preserved and passed on to a new generation through monasteries, through Christian monks. And from these monasteries came the first universities. The first one was in Paris in the 12th century, and then Oxford and Cambridge was founded in, in England in the 13th century. We're talking the 1200s now. And the motto of Oxford when it was founded was Psalm 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light. Followers of Jesus began these universities in Rome, in Naples, in Vienna, in Heidelberg, and they were founded so that people could love the Lord their God with all their minds because they believed that this world was created by a rational God and therefore uh, you, you can discover God by studying the, the world. And they called them universities because they were studying the universe that God had created. And the people who taught you were called professors because they, they professed a belief that they had information to share with you that's true and important. And we call it a profession of faith for the same reason, that we have a, Christ, a, a faith in Christ. And so we're professors as well because we profess that we have something good and important and true to share with the world. So it was all based on this faith that came out of these monasteries. Then in the, in the 1500s, I went to have a German dinner last night to get prepared for this at the Lutheran church. And Martin Luther in the 1500s changed education when he read it in the Bible. It talks about how we are the priesthood of believers. And he said, you know, priesthood, a priesthood should be educated. They should be able to read the scriptures. And if we're all the priesthood, that means everybody should be able to read and write. And so... Education for everyone became the rule in the 1500s as it became a, a goal to have literacy for everyone. And that took effect in America in the 1600s when our first colonists came over here, the Puritans. In 1647 in Massachusetts, the Puritans uh, passed the first Universal Education Act giving free education to all kids. It was the name of the act is, says something. It was called the Old Deluder Satan Act of 1647. This is education, old deluder Satan. It says, our chief product of the old deluder Satan was to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures, and therefore to get rid of that ignorance was their goal. So it was Christians who started free education. So it wasn't just for rich kids in America. It was for everyone. And now we might whine about going to school. Some of us didn't like school very much, but it was free, and we had, a, you know, we had the opportunity to have it that didn't exist before Christ. Within six years in, of landing in Massachusetts, the Puritans started a college, and this college had the motto in their handbook saying, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well that the main end of this life in study is to know God in Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ as the only foundation for all sound knowledge and learning. You know what university that was the founding statement for? That the main end is to know Christ? Harvard. And shortly after that, Yale and William and Mary and Princeton and Brown colleges were also founded with that same founding purpose that the main end of all one's life is to know God and Jesus Christ. And the re reason for our studying is to know God and Jesus Christ. All but one school started before the American Revolution in the United States was started by a Christian mission of some sort with that purpose in mind, to know God. All but one school. And 92% of the first 138 colleges and universities founded in the United States, 92% were founded by Christian followers of Christ who, who wanted to share that faith through their education that we should love the Lord our God with our minds. The Cumberland Presbyterian Church denomination started in 1810. Between then and 1906, we founded 13 colleges in that, that century, including Missouri Valley College here in Marshall. Education took a hit in the world when the Industrial Revolution came along, and children were put in factories to work, and so they weren't getting schooled. Uh, kids from the age of six or seven were working in factories for, for 12, 15-hour days. And so Sunday school started, believe it or not, when a British person named Robert Rakes created Sunday school as a means to teach factory kids how to read and write on Sunday because they had to work all the other six days of the week. So it was to help 
elevate them and give them a chance to get out of that trap of working in these factories. The alphabet of the Slavic people is called Cyrillic because St. Cyril, a Christian, saw these people couldn't read the scripture, so they didn't have a written language, and so he created an alphabet in their language and created their language for them so they could have the Bible in their language. And as some of them people have said, God speaks my language too now. And you know, as a result, that many other similar ministries, like the Wycliffe Bible Society, uh, Pioneer Bible Translators, some of you support Kyle and Katie Von Ruden from our church, I know. And they are doing that work in Africa right now, translating the Bible into a language that does not exist yet by creating that language phonetically. The Each One Teach One mission started with a, with a Methodist missionary who, uh, who, who wound up then taking his uh, ideas of education to 100, 100 countries and developed primers in 313 languages to help illiterate people learn to read. Why did he do this? so they could read about Jesus in their own language. But what about education that gets into the science? You know, many people think science and religion don't go along, right? But the fact is, science as we know it exists because of Jesus Christ. Because Christians, unlike the Greek thinkers, believed that matter was good because it was created by God, whereas the Greeks thought all matter was evil, they could study the world around us and because God is a rational, orderly God, we could expect there to be ration, uh, rationale and, and order to the universe around us. So science began as people accepting that God created it, so it must be good, and we could learn more about God by studying it. And as one of the brilliant mathematicians and astronomers, Johannes Kepler, wrote, God, like a master builder, has laid the foundations of the world according to law and order. God wanted us to recognize those laws by creating us after his image so that we could share in his own thoughts. And John Ortberg points out that a vast majority of the pioneers of science, William of Ockham, Francis Bacon, Galileo, Copernicus, Blaise Pascal, Joseph Priestley, Louis Pasteur, Isaac Newton, all viewed their work as learning to think God's thoughts. American scientist George Washington Carver, what's he famous for? Coming up with hundreds and maybe thousands of uses of, of the what? The peanut. He said he started by holding up a peanut and said, God, what's inside a peanut? And that's, it began from wanting to know what God has created there. It is a belief in the rationality of God that allowed science to come about, and it, this is not to say that scientific study might not have existed in some other way, but I'm just telling you this is the way it happened because of belief in God. And when we use the word science, it's kind of like salt and pepper. Science and technology kind of go, to go along together, and just to a couple ideas on that. Labor-saving devices that we have were oftentimes created by Christians who wanted to make it life easier for others, in some cases so that they could go to church on Sunday um, and have, some, have, a, have a little bit of a break and not have to work seven days a week. But labor-saving devices, uh, because we began to say that work, although work is a godly thing, toil, unnecessary work, is a result of, of, of sin in the world. And so we want to get rid of toil. And that means if we can put shoes on a horse and a harness on the horse, he could do work that, that two or three guys were having to do, and we could save some labor there and, and save some back-breaking work for other people to do. And although horses were not native to Europe, they were introduced from other places. It was Europe, which was influenced by the Christian the spread of Christianity, that developed horses in that way as a labor-saving device. Monks developed the windmill to, tr to, to grind the grain so that they would have more time to pray and do Christian work. So the windmill and the, and the, grind the grist mills, mechanical clocks were invented by monks who wanted to know what time it was so they'd know when it was time to pray. After the sun went down and you couldn't look at a sundial anymore, they wanted to know what time it was. And so churches and communities were oftentimes the first place that had a clock. And even today, First Christian Church rings the, t the hour for us as a reminder that that's where time was, was revolutionized by believers in Jesus Christ who wanted to use their time to celebrate him. Eyeglasses were first developed by monks in the 1300s so they could read scriptures. 
Sometimes the church has resisted ideas that were counter to their beliefs, and we've even turned on other believers. You know, I, I, well, we'll give you that information. You need to know that, you know, Galileo, Copernicus, those people I mentioned that came with Christian faith in their science, but not everybody wanted to believe. Copernicus believed that the, the, the universe revolved around the sun and not the earth, and people wanted to, to just literally, you know, brutalize him for that. He was right. And in learning about how things work, you know, maybe we need to learn that things revolve around the sun, if you know what I'm saying, instead of around us, around the Son of God, instead of around us. But anyway, we can learn more about God. Loving God with all of our minds, John Ortberg says, means that if people you disagree with come along, you, you, you have an answer for them. You don't burn their work. You, you talk. You work with them. So one day, a carpenter left his shop and began to teach. And I want you to think about what would this world have been like if Jesus had not done that? If he'd stayed in the carpenter's shop, what would this world have been like? There would be no crucifixion, no ministry, no rise of the church, no New Testament scriptures, no monastic communities, and therefore there would be no universities, maybe no Oxford, no Cambridge, no Harvard, no Yale, no free public education perhaps. Jesus' impact on our world was amazing. And if we're faithful followers of Jesus, his impact will be unending. This week I visited my mom in the nursing home. And I asked how she was, and she says, I feel terrible. And she says, I, I feel like I'm getting worse every day. And all I could say was, we have the hope Aren't you glad we have this hope in Jesus that this is not all there is and that God has prepared a place for us and that God has things, better things ahead for us than we can possibly imagine? Can you imagine, I said to mom, what this would be like to go through this if you didn't have that hope? What I'm saying is Jesus makes the difference. And if you haven't, found that difference for yourself. I'm hoping that seeing the difference he's made in the world will help you know that he can make that difference in your world as well. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've told us that, that when we seek you, we will find. When we knock, the door will be open. When we ask, we will be receive. It will be given to us. And Lord, I pray that you will give us hearts that are constantly seeking you in this world around us and seeking your truth and to know you better, to worship you with our minds. And Lord, I pray that each of us here today will, ha will know that difference in our life that only you can make, that we'll have that relationship with you that, that makes the difference in how we see the mess of our world because we see the king of our world in you. So I pray that you will speak to each heart here today that we might seek that difference in our lives as well. In Jesus' name, amen.